How is everyone today? Thank you all for coming. I'm Michelle Avery. I'm the head of Autonomous and Urban Mobility at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution based in San Francisco. The Forum Center is a place for multi-stakeholder dialogue to talk about the opportunities and the challenges brought about by advanced technologies like what we see with autonomous vehicles. Our mission is to co-design, test, and refine governance policy frameworks to maximize the societal benefits and minimize the risks associated with autonomous vehicles. And autonomous vehicles really have the potential to truly change urban mobility. We have the chance to save lives, to reduce pollution, reduce congestion, which I think would be beneficial, especially in San Francisco where I live and maybe a few other places, as well as to eliminate transportation deserts. But it's not gonna happen by accident. It's something we're gonna have to do together. And that's what we're here to talk about, laying the groundwork for autonomous vehicles here in China. And we've assembled experts in technology, in platforms, in infrastructure, and of course, the vehicle itself. And leading our panel this morning is Allison Snyder, who is the managing editor at Axios. She is a scientist turned journalist whose work has appeared in the Washington Post, Newsweek, Daily Beast, just to name a few. She has a degree in chemical engineering from MIT, studied botany at the <laughs> University of Canterbury, mm -hmm. is that correct, in New Zealand, as well as a master's in journalism from New York University. She oversees the newsroom science coverage as well as Expert Voices platform. And you're launching an autonomous vehicle newsletter. Is that tomorrow? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow. <laughs> I'll let her tell you all about that. Please join me in welcoming Allison and the panel today. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for mentioning our newsletter. It's coming tomorrow. Um, I'm happy to tell you how to sign up afterwards if you come and find me. Uh, but thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited to be joined on stage uh, by this panel. And, um, you know, China leads, I'll just a, a little brief setup, that China leads the world in electric vehicle sales. I think it was 24 million last year um, and has an ambitious plan to deploy 30 million fully autonomous vehicles by t in the next decade and uh, is really likely to be one of the early adopters of this technology. And so the core question that we're here to look at this morning is, you know, what's needed here in China to successfully launch, develop, and scale autonomous vehicles? And on stage, I get to introduce uh, this great panel. Next to me is uh, Raphael Jindrat. I'm going to, we, we agreed that I could pronounce it like that. He um, is, <laughs> is CEO and chairman of Best Mile. It's a mobility services platform for managing fleets of vehicles, including autonomous vehicles. Um, next to him is Brian Gu, who is the vice chairman and president of Xiaoping Motors Technology, one of the most talked about startup, automotive startups here in China. Thank you for being here. And next to him is Hung Chi Lu. He is with AECOM, which is one of the world's largest infrastructure and engineering firms, where he is senior vice president for the Asia Pacific region and the head of strategy and development for Greater China. And on the end is Tobias Vanneman, and he's the managing director and co-founder of TopoSense, uh, which has developed a 3D uh, near-range ultrasound sensor for autonomous vehicles. So, Thank you all for being here. And I am going to come to the audience throughout for questions. We're going to make this pretty informal. Um, so have your questions ready. But I want to just first do a quick poll and a show of hands. How many people in the room would put their child in an autonomous vehicle today? OK. We're going to come back to this at the end. <laughs> see, if, see if anybody's changed their mind. Um, <laughs> see, we're going to try and maybe change their mind. Um, so my first question is actually for you, Raphael, and that's the, the goal of 30 million uh, autonomous vehicles here. What, what opportunities does that represent? Well, I think globally it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, in a few years, we are going to see the first commercial fleets of robotaxi in a few cities all around the globe. Mm -hmm. It might be cities like San Francisco, Singapore, 
maybe Dubai, but for sure China is going to be a huge part of this market. Um, I think China is particular because we have a lot of mobility issues. Um, so the opportunities may be bigger than in other countries. Uh, but the main goal is to make sure we have really safe vehicles, make sure we have transportation companies operating this kind of fleets efficiently, uh, because just having private autonomous vehicle doesn't make a lot of sense, at least if you want to reduce traffic and have a, a lot of additional, let's say, uh, benefits. Um, so it's all about an ecosystem, building an ecosystem, having the right uh, regulation and finding uh, the right partner. So you talk about uh, reducing congestion. So what are some of, the, I guess, the, the nuances there? Because this is not like a more AVs, less congestion type. No, it's, it, it's all thing? about shared, connected, electric, and autonomous vehicle. Mm -hmm. Just autonomous vehicle will not solve a lot of problem, besides maybe a number of accidents. But if we want to have a lot of benefits, when it comes to traffic, when it comes to air pollution, these kind of vehicles have to be connected and shared in some kind of car sharing, ride hailing solutions. Otherwise, we will not have all these benefits. Mm -hmm. And Brian, can I ask from a business standpoint what the opportunity is here in particular, just to give people a sense of the scale? Well, I think uh, um, autonomous driving, you know, in my mind, is, represents probably one of the largest uh, value disruption and creations in the mobility industry. Um, if you look at China, right, I mean, China has its own, you know, mobility champion like Didi um, and a lot of other um, share ride service companies. But the biggest cost component for them, number one is driver, number two is fuel. I think the advancements in autonomous driving and also coupled with the energy um, you know, movement from the traditional energy vehicle to new energy vehicle like EV, I think takes away probably the most significant cost component in transportation. Mm -hmm. And that will liberate and also allow um, the mobility models to really flourish. So I think that's one uh, opportunity. But on the flip side, um, what we increasingly see is that uh, autonomous driving is it's something that, yes, you know, we can actually uh, develop and make advancements quickly in, a, I would say, small trial settings. Mm -hmm. But when you really couple that with the vast uh, driving scenarios in China as well as having, you know, that many vehicles on the road, it's a very different game. So, you know, moving from zero to one and how that process will unfold will really kind of dictate the, you know, advancement of this industry. I mean, it sounds like the transit, which is I think often the case with many technologies, but the transition period is going to be bumpy, maybe? <laughs> it will be bumpy, it will be long. Uh, I think also it will be difficult to imagine, uh, you know, the full autonomous scenarios will be available anytime soon in a large, open scenario. I think it will probably start with more controlled settings, uh, either in campuses, in parks, where these uh, autonomous uh, driving can be um, applied first, and also the data collection can start. Because I think without data, you cannot really get to the real um, autonomous driving scenarios. Um, so what we do, I mean, just maybe a couple uh, uh, words on Xiaopeng Motors. We are obviously one is an EV player, but at the same time we're developing autonomous driving that hopefully we can put in our vehicle this year, next year, uh, which means that we want to make sure those technologies can be utilized, uh, tried by our drivers. It can be safe. Um, whether it will involve full autonomous driving, I think that will be a few years out. Mm -hmm. Even level three, I think probably in the next year or two is probably limited to certain, um, I would say, low speed or safer uh, scenario, uh, driving scenarios. But I think in the long run, though, I think China, with the government and with the capital behind it, will be, you know, I think, a very large opportunity uh, in the five to ten years, I would say. And so um, autonomous vehicles are obviously poised to transform mobility and how we move, but also cities themselves. And so I'm curious from you sort of what, how, how that, what that might look like and how you're going about thinking about, what considerations are you taking in um, when you think about how cities themselves are gonna be changing? Sure, sure. Um, uh, uh, from uh, urban planning uh, or infrastructure point of view, we observe and we understand that since the first car was made 130 years ago, I think the city the cityscape and uh, social pattern completely changed. I believe uh, automobile 
is even though not the only one, probably the greatest factor that change uh, the, the, the environment we live. So uh, up to now, we understand lots of uh, urban issues, particularly uh, uh, traffic congestions, uh, really bother uh, uh, us uh, as a part of a livability quality. So um, uh, as an urban planner or infrastructure uh, 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 builder, uh, we believe uh, there are a couple ways to look at aut autonomous driving technologies. One is make the car smarter. The other is make the streets smarter. And uh, we are very keen to uh, look at how autom uh, autonomous vehicles uh, be applied in view of uh, addressing those urban problems and enhance and achieve the comfort of, of our uh, communities. So uh, there's a great uh, potential we are able to revisit um, our streets. The street no longer for cars, although we call autonomous vehicles still cars, but uh, we believe uh, the, uh, the, the notion of that is being able to see cars part of pedestrian. Mm -hmm. So we are able to reduce the number of lanes, narrow down the width of the lanes, and uh, uh, bring the car closer, however, still uh, stay safe. They will release lots of land resources for parking. As far as we know, uh, out of a, a 100 car, only five of them running on the street. So we may reduce the ownership of a car uh, to you know, 5% of what we are, we are having now. That means uh, we have a lot of new leverage in our urban environment to use the land and space for different purposes. And the street can be designed differently as well. And when we are given this opportunity uh, as an infrastructure, the streets or, the, or even the, uh, uh, the community setting uh, have a brand new opportunity that redesign for people, not for cars. Mm -hmm. So I believe that presents not only a business opportunity, but also an opportunity for human beings to revisit how we choose to live. What's one thing that you wish um, the technology side better understood about the urban planning or infrastructure side of this? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think they're always uh, two track, so don't talk to each other a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, we are here for a reason. We, all, we look at the, the, how to lay the ground for China. And uh, 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 just about uh, 2010, China's urbanization, urban population reached 50 percent. We are going moving forward to 70 percent in five or ten years. Uh, that means China is given the, the uh, advantage to uh, reform and uh, uh, experiment, make the experiments how aut autonomous vehicle can impact uh, the city. And um, uh, I think the, the, the focus is not the car itself, is, is, that, is that we start with looking at what is happening to Chinese city or uh, uh, representing the urbanization globally and uh, we are able to address how people live and work, you know, how you, how you want to uh, take mobility further. In China, people live far away from where they work. So the distance of travel the time you spend on travel, the frequency you, you travel per day, and uh, the way you take travel, and the experience your travel, I think all together uh, put together the sense of ownership of our mobility. So we are given the chance to visit that quality instead of uh, uh, not only the car technology itself. I think that will balance and uh, direct the technology go to the direction that uh, enhance our uh, uh, livability. I want to come back to that, but I want to ask Tobias a little bit about um, mapping, because this is something that directly, you know, as cities change, um, and you know, some are, I mean, they're just dynamic environments, right? So, what's the, um, I guess, the scope and scale of the challenge with mapping to bring together um, the cities themselves and the cars? Yeah, um, also, sure, a good question. Uh, so mapping is, I think, a topic uh, that is also, yeah, or in general, in autonomous driving, everything is still in, in, in chaos, you can really say, uh, because there are so many different uh, directions everybody is thinking, um, ways are going. 
um, concerning mapping, um, some people say you need high de definition maps um, uh, being um, uh, over 5G um, present in the cars all the time, for example. That's why you have these big uh, mapping companies like here, for example. Um, then you have recent studies which are talking about you don't need high definition maps at all because the cars can, uh, over yeah, uh, slam algorithms, find their own position inside the surroundings and uh, the sensors are good enough uh, to, to perceive the environment in, in such a level of detail that you don't need the high definition maps. Um, I think um, you pr probably um, pr probably just um, us going forward, um, piloting, testing more will show what the what the truth is in the end. Yeah, if you need the high definition uh, maps or not. Um, looking at the infrastructure side, looking at changes in infrastructure and updating um, uh, that frequently. Um, I think the easiest um, the easiest thing um, is probably when you when the cars themselves perceive their environment in a very high level of detail because especially when you're not in the urban areas uh, where you have updates all the time but rather in rural areas and the cars still have to drive fully autonomous um, then then that's probably the easiest way of, of, of going forward if the car um, themselves can decide where they are and move themselves and oh I've lost connection for some sort of reason um, because you maybe cannot implement 5g all over the place, all over the world, and every place a car can go to. Um, so therefore, I think the um, yeah, it will be a mixture. It will definitely be a mixture. Uh, you will definitely support high definition maps to cars if possible. But there must be ways. If you don't have that um, high definition maps available, uh, that you are also able to drive the car and doesn't stop and say, okay, I'm not driving anymore. Now think of a car not having a steering wheel anymore and you stop and the car says, I don't have high definition maps anymore, I have to stop here, please walk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe not the best idea. So there must be another solution, maybe a plan B with the sensor side uh, of the car themselves locating them. Right. You're shaking your head. Oh, yeah, I fully agree. And this is why also having this kind of vehicles in a, in a robot taxi type of fleet, mm -hmm. or also in a campus or in a closed site, is going to be a, an easier first step because it's a place where you know the limits, you know where the car can do or not do, and so at least you can, you can control a little bit better all these kind of issues about mapping and, and connectivity. And also maybe having some kind of additional constraints, like maybe some really complex part of the cities uh, are not allowed for autonomous vehicles, but you have these kind of vehicles working in places where it's a little bit easier. And this is why the transition period is going to take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of vehicles will not be able to go everywhere at any time. So human driven fleets are still going to be very useful for at least a decade. And all this kind of system will have to work together in parallel. Mm -hmm. yeah, also um, I think it relates to the consumer behavior. I think uh, having a more ref defined or, or, or limited setting, I think allows uh, people I mean, to get transitioned into using autonomous vehicle. I think that process, I think, needs to happen. And you cannot throw people into a full autonomous world. I think people need to get used to sitting in an autonomous vehicle, you know, walking by an autonomous vehicle and be comfortable with that. So I think that scenario, I think, is more likely to happen. So in, in, like, in terms of consumer acceptance or even, let's just say, interest, um, there seems to be a wide range. I was just looking at this last night. It was like, I think, um, a survey of across many different countries, it was like 36% of people in Japan versus, uh, what is it, 85% in India, 75% in China are in, in favor of, of using this. That's a wide range. How do you like even begin to uh, address that from a, from a business standpoint? Well, I think uh, when people ask that question, probably most people still haven't had a sense of what exactly it means mm -hmm. to be in an autonomous world. Um, I think people would like to, you know, using, you know, uh, use autonomous vehicles and simplify their travel. But I think uh, once you throw them into the real world and have the issues of safety, of regulation, of legal liability, of all, everything that needs to be considered, I think people will actually probably hesitate uh, this moment to sit in a uh, full autonomous vehicle in, on a regular street. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, I think there is, I would say, a general um, a desire to get to the autonomous stage of transportation. But I think uh, today, I would say the general public still, I would not expect them to have a full understanding of what that means, which means that it will take a long time of education for consumers to adopt that right. lifestyle. 
Um, I want to go and bring the audience in for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and introduce yourself, and then we'll bring a mic around. Um, I think you were first here. Uh, there he comes. Hi, I'm Martin Brunsko. Uh, I'm based in London. Uh, I'm a technology investor uh, in venture capital, deep tech, including transportation. So this vision of autonomous vehicles that we have in front of us, it's a, and the vision that Silicon Valley is pushing, it's a very American vision in the sense of this individual autonomous, you know, I don't need anybody kind of cars. We can just figure it out all by ourselves using our own sensors. And wouldn't it actually make more sense instead of just doing this fully autonomous vision to also rely on a vision which is much more collaborative? Uh, and where I'm going to is, you know, this vehicle to vehicle communications, vehicle to infrastructure communications. Wouldn't that be actually something, or to what extent do you think this is something that could really fast forward our future and make these autonomous cars much more safe, uh, that would help us to remove a lot of these corner cases which are so difficult to solve uh, individually, and also what it would mean in terms of uh, implementation, uh, in terms of infrastructure, and, and across the vehicle feeds, fleets. Who would like to take that? Um, so, so your main question is uh, how important is vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infrastructure communication? in making it much uh, much more easy to actually apply this or implement this future of, of you know fully autonomous vehicles or fully fully autonomous yet collaborative with other autonomous vehicles mm, yeah i think just um, yeah, just a quick thought on that um, i think it doesn't go one way or the other um, you need uh, to to it, it always depends on how far you want to go uh, concerning autonomous driving um, i think when we talk about think of uh, autonomous driving we always think about the the level five somehow like everything is driving autonomously um, but there will be a very very long I'm, not, I'm talking about very very long like maybe 30 years or 40 years transition period until everything is autonomous um, so in between there will be different um, yeah, levels and stages and uh, vehicle to vehicle vehicle to infrastructure uh, communication is definitely one one important piece of the equation you cannot have uh, cars just driving by sensors and not getting any communication from from, from somewhere uh, so f so 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 in my opinion to, to the, the the highest level of autonomy will always be a combination of like like yeah it's it's high tech so it's the most high definition maps it's the best vehicle to vehicle vehicle to um, 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 infrastructure communication it's the best sensor suite it's the best artificial intelligence that defines the maximum possibility how far autonomy can go yeah, so so therefore I wouldn't say is just the communication side or just the sensor side will always be a mixture um, of it yeah. there was another question over here uh, in the back thank you please come <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Daniel Garcia. I'm from Acciona, a Spanish company. I'm the director of the Advanced and Digital Innovation Hub. We are, you know, quite concerned, you know, about, uh, about this technology, about autonomous vehicles. And my question is, uh, do you think that uh, it's for all the panel? Do you think that there is going to be a space for other kind of technologies, for example, like teleoperated uh, uh, vehicles? For example, uh, I imagine that uh, nearly not all the problems that uh, has to solve the autonomous vehicle could be solved just by the machine. Perhaps it needs somebody, you know, behind that is able to teleoperate the business, I, uh, the teleoperate the, the vehicle. I'm talking, for example, like companies like Phantom Auto, you know, from from the states that have bus their business is trying to to reach that part of the market. Uh, what do you think about it? Thank you. For, for me, it's a really interesting technology, but always as a fallback. We just said before that for companies like Didi. The biggest cost is drivers. So if you just have teleoperated drivers, it doesn't make any sense. But as of today or in a few years, we will have autonomous vehicle capable to handle like 95.95% of the situations. And we will have a few use cases where vehicles might need some kind of external help. And this is where teleoperation can, uh, can provide a, a really nice solution. But again, you need connectivity and really good connectivity because you need a really small latency. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. So I think it's going to be a, a really important technology for this kind of transition period. And as it was said, it's going to take decades. Uh, so yes, clearly it's important. Any other questions from the audience right now? Oh, there we go. Morning. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, André Borchper from uh, Switzerland. Uh, my company is developing electric propulsion for the world of aviation, so nothing to do with cars. 
But uh, the goal, of course, is to make these um, aircrafts autonomous in the sky. That's how we increase the, uh, the uh, traffic density. Uh, my question or my reflection, and of course in the world of aviation, you have, if you want to bring something in the air, you have to demonstrate that you are ready, I mean, that it's safe. And so for autonomous vehicle, how do you come with the decision uh, to decide, I mean, to say that the technology is at a state where I can bring this on the road? And I think this is, of course, something very important to be communicated to the public. I think we would have more hand uh, up for our kids in the car if we know, in fact, the criteria you use to bring uh, these autonomous cars on the, uh, on the roads. Yeah, who would like to take the question of how does safety test this, what the sort of, I guess, metrics are? Well, I, I think, uh, um, let me just take this from, from our perspective, right? So um, clearly safety is uh, the most important issue for making cars. Um, that's why I think uh, uh, at this stage, I, I would not even say people are, are able to s claim that they have full, even level three in a car, which means that you hands-free and let a car drive itself, but you had to sit in the driver's seat. Um, what we feel like at this stage, at least was given the technology and given the safety tests that we've seen is that I think level two ATIS is probably still the most widely used uh, technology. Level three is still, is available, but only in low speed scenarios where there's uh, less chance of accident. For example, in parking lots, you actually don't need to, you can actually have totally hands-free parking scenarios, which we're designing for our vehicle. But whether the, um, the car can be on the road uh, and having totally uh, um, autonomous, I think it will require demonstration of, you know, you have less intervention in self-driving scenarios. So, for example, level four, I know a lot of company that we're working with uh, is testing China. Obviously, one of the uh, parameters is to see how much, how many interventions that they will see during, in the course of driving of, you know, per thousand mile, per million miles. Um, I think at a certain point, I think uh, you have to make a judgment. The other side of the story, I think, is um, legal framework. Because I think uh, one challenge to put these autonomous drive, driving vehicles on the road is whether you have the legal framework to define the responsibility, whether it's car or driver. I would say that to me, in China or even globally, is probably one of the largest, I would say, bottlenecks because there hasn't been a very clear definition, at least in this part of the world, when you actually you know, combine autonomous driving with normal driving conditions outside. So I think the technology advancement plus legal framework development will have to come together to ultimately allow autonomous driving to be um, on the road. May, 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 may I add to that? Oh yeah, please. No, go ahead. Um, just, just one thought concerning the testing of safe vehicles. Um, I think that you'll do, um, there are so many test facilities and in Germany I'm thinking of the TÜV, which is big in, in setting up safety standards. Mm -hmm. Um, so there will be a, uh, definitely a cooperation uh, between uh, the, the, the car companies, uh, the legislation, um, and uh, yeah, the yeah, safety institution. Let's call them. Let's call them that way, like like TÜV, which will set up parameters. Uh, what kind of scenarios will have to be tested and be passed by the cars? So if all these parameters will, will be passed, but that's still to be discussed. Yeah. So how, what does a car have to do and to, to pass these tests? Um, if those are passed, I think that will be like the stamp. Okay, this car is good to go under these specific conditions to go on the road what these conditions are if it's just maybe one lane on the on the highway or something that also has to be defined so I think there is still a lot of discussion that uh, that still uh, will still have to take place uh, but will definitely that, that's also why we're sitting here from so many different um, viewpoints uh, a lot of discussion between different parties needed yeah is it important from a safety standpoint to um, uh, to understand why the AI is doing what it's doing is it like to have a transparent or explainable AI or is it more is it the results do does anybody have a strong I think it will be important not yeah it's like giving a driving license to an AI mm -hmm. so how do you test and validate that and if you have uh, an update like the week after how do you make sure the new version is still compliant with the initial driving license uh, so having some kind of ways to understand why AI took some kind of decision is going to be really important Otherwise, people will not have any trust on these kind of vehicles. Um, but I agree, it's all about testing, about doing a lot of miles. Uh, if you look at what Waymo or uh, General Motors are currently doing in the United States, it's 
seems to be a really scalable and safe technology. And these companies are quite close to start deploying the first robotaxi types of fleets uh, in Arizona and, and San Francisco. And at some point, you also have to take, I would say, some kind of small risk in order to test and validate at scale, um, even if you don't have regulation yet. So it's all about speed versus regulation, taking risk or being too slow and too safe. And it's a, it's a quite a difficult situation and decision for big transportation companies or car companies. It's also you, government and media's tolerance for risk. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, one thing, uh, in, I think in the U.S., I think uh, obviously a lot of the tests, uh, uh, even some of the uh, accidents are reported, but that did not hamper the development too much. I mean, there's obviously some pause. But I would say in China, uh, given the media scrutiny and also social media, sort of the viral, uh, the, the nature of it, uh, it, it is quite difficult to, for government and for, gov uh, for media to tolerate uh, risk and then serious accident risks. So that's something I think uh, we'll yeah. have to play into um, the, the equation. Mm. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. as of today, we know how many deaths we have globally around the globe, and most of them are caused by human error, and it's like 1.2 million, so several planes per day crashing. Um, what will be the tolerance? Is it like half, 20, 10 percent, maybe less? Uh, so people will not tolerate a lot of deaths caused by robots. I'd just like to raise one uh, a notion. I can agree more with uh, this gentleman's comments. Um, I think uh, uh, there's an advantage and opportunity in Chinese city that I'd, uh, for making the street smarter. I'd like to reassess the notion. Uh, we focus on the car to make our street and people safer, but uh, they also we are able to leverage how streets and city be designed. And the advantage of China is that I think China has given probably more opportunity than other countries have a new city. Uh, we talk about accommodating this technology in a given or established city, that's one thing. But in China, you have a new city to experience. The city can be redesigned re in a brand new way uh, to enhance the sense of safety. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think human behavior can be, uh, uh, become data or to be uh, intelligized, but uh, human still human. And uh, I do like to uh, bring up the notion that uh, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are very keen to think about how uh, streets be designed to accommodate autonomous vehicles. And uh, I have interesting com uh, communication with uh, the, the director of MCD in Michigan University. And uh, what he told me that in, U in the United States, it's almost impossible to expect the government invest on street. So the only way is to make your car smarter, just like the people, or smarter than people in terms of driving. But in China, and the government is ready to rethink and redesign the street. So there are two things we look, think are very important. One is how to iterate the current uh, street network or, uh, or, or social pattern uh, to accommodate the technologies from stage one to maybe stage five. And the other is, if we are given a brand new city, how street will look differently. And then uh, once we uh, also put that notion and uh, make the efforts on the physical environment and work together with the autonomous technology, I think uh, we can achieve much better results. And uh, the people may have a much greater level of adaption to this uh, new technology. It means you have cities only for autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Yes. yes. Right. Good morning, my name is Michael Lim. I uh, was responsible for um, uh, leading Los Angeles' autonomous vehicle strategy effort for some time. Um, as, as I uh, spent um, my time with the city of LA, one thing that became very clear to me is that connectivity, and earlier one of the gentlemen mentioned you know, V2I and V2V, um, I came to realize that that's a pretty critical component, especially as we think about creating a utopic vision where you know, it's human focused, there's multimodality, streets are designed so that it's aligned and integrated fully with the vehicles. I'm just curious as to earlier, you know, the gentleman asked a question about, you know, what are you doing or what, what are your perspective about V2V and V2I um, in terms of actual allocation of resources and capital? Um, could you tell us a little bit more? <laughs> Michelle, do you have anything? 
comment on there? It's a big question, obviously. Spectrum, it's a, it's a public good without a doubt, and it, and it is a, a barrier and something that I think is we would like to have a lot more dialogue on all as we plan for this. Some of it is how much data is necessary, and we talked a little bit about teleoperations here oh. and the reality of the latency, and that's non-trivial when you're looking at wireless networks. And cities need to think about the infrastructure required to enable that level of, of technology. So I think from an urban planning perspective, there's a big discussion to be had there, as well as the technology providers and that is going inside the vehicle, the way that the regulators are allocating spectrum will have a huge impact on what technologies you can deploy inside of vehicles. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely an area we at the forum would like to, con co to continue the dialogue, get a lot more uh, deeper, pragmatic on this discussion. So thank maybe, you for bringing it up. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a question back. Um, what, what kind of, um, what do you see as important information that is tr to be transferred from vehicle to vehicle and, and V2I? Well, just to give a quick example, um, right now the way, I mean, earlier we spoke about autonomy being part of a fleet, right? Because you can help mitigate congestion. Um, so let's talk about congestion, for instance, right? If you have vehicles that are traveling around um, behaving in a way that is optimal from the vehicle's perspective, but not necessarily optimal from a macro perspective for the city's, city's perspective, you're still gonna have um, more congestion than you would otherwise. If you, can, if you can understand where the vehicles are going, and if you can optimize the performance of the infrastructure, for instance, say traffic signals, and integrate everything and look at it from a systems, per systems perspective because you have connectivity and data is being shared, then you can have a much more um, uh, greater outcome than you would otherwise. So uh, these are some of the things that I'm considering. Same thing with multimodality. When you have connectivity between the vehicle with, with say, pedestrians or, um, say, cyclists or whatnot, there's an opportunity for you to further increase safety, for instance. So uh, from that perspective, connectivity and uh, data sharing would be uh, pretty critical. Um, and in terms of that, the notion of co-creation with cities, I think it's very important mm -hmm. because you know, I've, be, I've, I've been on the private side and also on the public side as well, and oftentimes there are reasons why private sector and the public sector don't always engage. And you, know, you mentioned earlier that there's, there are parallel tracks that are happening right now. I'm curious as to how you think about you know, uh, whether there are some structures that are in, uh, set up in China, for instance, to engender um, more collaboration or enable more collaboration. I fully agree with you, and uh, this is the main goal of what we do at BestMile, for example. You, you have to take into account all the different interests when you deploy a fleet, a fleet like that. Clearly, you have traveler interest, you have fleet operator or fleet owner interest, but also city interest. And if you want to uh, reduce traffic, you have to take into account these kind of things. And all these systems have to be integrated in, into existing multimodal solutions. It doesn't make sense to replace a train or a metro with autonomous vehicle or even a big bus. Uh, so this kind of system has to be connected to each other and have to work uh, together. I want to pick up on a thread actually that you just had there, which is um, in China, uh, I think all EVs start, well, largely or solely, all uh, EV startups are private enterprises, right? Is that, I think? Yes. Right mm -hmm. yes. Um, so how might the, pri uh, the private sector and the state sort of work together to achieve this goal of, of even 30 million AVs? And well, I think, uh, first of all, I mean, I think uh, EV is, the reason I think there's that many EV startups is a lot of opportunities, both presented by the government capital as well as even the private capital. So uh, first of all, I think uh, the benefit of having, uh, starting an EV company in China is that there's a lot of uh, resources uh, that's available um, to develop this, I would say, uh, um, a new enterprise. A um, lot of the EV companies in China, uh, when they started, I think um, uh, they mostly focus on design and technology rather than manufacturing, which is probably the most expensive part of EV uh, uh, starting up, um, com you know, looking at Tesla and uh, how much money that went into the manufacturing side. Whereas in China, I think manufacturing probably is less likely a bottleneck uh, because one is government gives a lot of resources and policies, allow you to develop manufacturing capabilities without a lot of your own capital. 
Secondly, is there a lot of capacity in China that you can actually leverage? For example, our vehicle uh, utilizes uh, uh, contract manufacturing for the first phase of the growth. So that help you, you know, leapfrog certain of the, uh, the I would say, resources, bottlenecks for EV. So I think you know, the government resources and also the availability of capital allowed Chinese EV players to flourish. Um, I think secondly is that it goes back to um, uh, certain um, autonomous driving uh, um, advantages in China is that there are you know, pockets of, I would say, government uh, or municipalities in China that's probably more uh, uh, aggressive in terms of uh, pushing forward with the autonomous driving agenda. For example, in Guangzhou, uh, there's a district, um, I think one of earlier, I think on, on our Nansha district is actually you know, one of the districts that has a lot of these autonomous driving vehicles being allowed to test everywhere in the district, just driving along normal uh, vehicles in China, which is, is very different compared to uh, uh, in, in the U US. Because those streets are, are, as you can imagine, very congested, very different. But I think the, the fact that government allows, allows these uh, testing of level four uh, technology to be on the road is a testament that China, I think, is in some pockets, I would not say all of them, is more tolerant. Uh, I think that also helps uh, with the development of autonomous driving technologies. So combined with resources, government's uh, support, and also certain availability of uh, scenario testing, I think that, I think, give, uh, I would say, a chance for China to be, hopefully, be in the forefront of this phenomenon. Can we take another question from uh, just back here, and then in the front, too? Oh, sorry. Uh, in the, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. We can just go around, if that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Christoph Wolf from the World Economic Forum. Um, autonomous vehicles are, are of, of course, a fascinating new technology. Uh, you were alluding to the fact that um, because it, there's no driver, so the economic potential is significant, especially if they're used in shared fleets. Yeah? So the cost per, mile. per passenger mile can actually go very low. Nevertheless, there, with all new technologies, there's a lot of concerns. Yeah? So, I mean, the safety concerns, number one. So, uh, technology is under scrutiny. I mean, even if you say it's, it's, it's safer than, than anything else, um, every single accident uh, has caused backlash. Yeah? And this is only the start of testing. I mean, if there's more testing, there's probably more, more of those. Um, and I also would think that the, the, uh, the tolerance for having kind of individualized autonomous uh, cars by, owned by people who can afford them roaming around the city and going to, to pick up some goods somewhere and then coming back or so. And, and adding congestion that is actually also relatively limited. So what would be your perception on how, how can you actually bring those autonomous vehicles into the market, into cities, uh, without um, having public backlash uh, slowing down that uh, development? We, we have to do it step by step, and we have to start by easy use cases. We spoke before about <laughs> private sites or closed sites which are going to be a first and easy use case. And uh, at Vesmile, we are managing 12 sites like that already today, and some of them are already inside city centers, but still in places which are pretty easy for, for vehicles. I think it's also a lot about communication and the way it's explained to people. We, we just spoke before about different level of autonomy, level two, three, four, five. Level five will take a lot of time and it's maybe not even needed. Level four are enough if you want to do robot taxi. But level two and level three, in my opinion, are not autonomous vehicles. It's like just cool driving assistances. It's nice, you can let the car drive uh, a little bit, but it's not a real autonomous vehicle. And so we have to be a little bit careful with that. And a good example is Tesla calling an ADAS, an autopilot, is a little bit misleading and it can cause uh, quite a lot of uh, issues. I, yeah, I, I also like to uh, uh, share a couple of thoughts. Uh, to, to increase a, the, the possibility of adapt, adaption of these technologies from urban planning point of view, uh, I think one thing is that uh, in terms of long range travel, uh, we probably okay to adapt the uh, autonomous driving, even though it's a 
trend or something like that. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to find out that uh, as the trend go in urban planning, we try to bring people back to maybe five minutes uh, living circle. That means you, we want to bring where you live and where you work closer together. And the more and more city, we found more percentage of people travel in short distance. I think that range of travel could be the, the greatest uh, 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 arena to apply uh, autonomous technology and autonomous vehicles. Uh, by saying so, I think the sense of a safety uh, is, is one, one thing very critical is to uh, uh, reduce the sense of uncertainties. So I suggest that in terms of infrastructure design, uh, we could start to assign uh, the, uh, the lens and the distance and route uh, for the autonomous vehicle to start with, uh, starting from public transit to increase the uh, expectation. And when I say the ownership, we want to regain the ownership of mobility. That means you have more options for travel and you know you can manage the time and where you want to go, how much time you spend and experience you want to get. So the more we do that, the, the better we can achieve and increase the level of the adaption of autonomous vehicles. So, uh, the, for example, if we, have, we see the public transit like a tram, you have a track. People know that car will run on that track. The only difference is that there was also a track for, auto, uh, for autonomous vehicle to start with. Yeah, it's a map, it's a GPS track. So once you have different pavings, a streetscape, people know what happened over there. I think the very important and very critical step uh, we can take first. Yeah. Well, one thing I just want to add is that the, the other aspect of uh, increased adoption by consumer drivers, you want to make sure the autonomous driving develop really applies to the local driving scenarios. I think it's very hard to imagine that you develop one autonomous driving you know, with mapping, with everything that, you know, you, you, yes, it's perfect works in California. You transplant to China, it will be the same, well, uh, you know, like system. Um, for example, and just a very small example, I mean, maybe go back to, uh, you said uh, level three is not autonomous driving. Even for level three, um, the Tesla autopilot in China, it, the, the dealer will advise you to turn it off. Do not use it because, you know, the, the map the navigation is not something that they want you to try. Um, even though, um, the, let's say parking is a small feature in uh, uh, autonomous driving vehicles. Um, you know, the autonomous driving uh, in the parking scenario, the Tesla autopilot parking, which it allows you to auto park, only applies to less than 20% of the potential parking scenarios in China. Most of the scenarios that people will park does not apply because the autonomous Autopilot 2.0 does not recognize the sign, does not recognize the shape, does not correct the, 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 the garage. So for us, in order to help consumer adopt to autonomous driving world is to design things that they could use to apply to their normal driving conditions. So for example, our you know, parking feature we designed so make sure it actually fits into 80 plus percent of potential driving scenarios that drivers in China will encounter. So those are the sort of things will also help consumer adoption. The gentleman right here. So we've already you know, discussed a lot of points on the safety of the system itself, so I'll not stress more on that. Uh, my question is, I mean, do we need a priority of you know, prioritizing a lane for automated driving? The reason being, even in a utopian scenario where we have reached, let's say, level five, the pedestrian still has an incentive to jaywalk across the street because the person knows the vehicle will stop for him. So is it there a need for you know, clear separation of you know, roads vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other regular modes of commute? We as an ecosystem, I believe personally that we need to take some inspiration from the way high-speed rails, both here in China as well as Japan, are designed, where you have clear barricades that separate the trains from other modes of you know, trains. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, I think that's what we're probably originally thinking why it makes sense in a very defined uh, uh, and uh, controlled uh, uh, area and scenario where I think uh, the campus or the area is designed where you know the autonomous driving and the people who's living or working in that scenario is used to having autonomous vehicle in that area. I think that'll take time. 
that area may take five years to expand to maybe you know, three times the size and gradually, you know, maybe over 10, 20 years, take over the whole city. But I think that process needs to happen just like what you said. It needs to slowly get people, you know, cyclists, pedestrians, you know, other car drivers to get used to having the um, autonomous vehicle next to them and how they interact and behave on the road. So that's a five, 10, potential 20 year process. But it's maybe more about zone than lane. Uh, like your campus is not just a lane, it's like a geographic entity. Uh, and Singapore already announced that they want to, to close some part of the cities where only autonomous vehicles will be allowed. Uh, because having this kind of mixed traffic uh, is going to be a challenge. So it's easier if you have only autonomous vehicle in a given place. And I agree with you, it's also easier for people to, to be used to this kind of system. Question in the back here. Hello, my name is Christopher Logan. A quick question about mapping. Uh, do you, today, is it mainly using static mapping or are you using the dynamic mapping? So what I mean by that is, where, say Singapore, where you've got videos at, mm -hmm. at all the intersections, or at least most of them, you actually know what pedestrians do, where they, you know, where they jaywalk, where they follow the, uh, the pedestrian crossings, where drivers game the system and, and uh, you know, go through the yellow lights and where they're, where they're not. That kind of information seems like it would be incredibly helpful. But is that, is that something that you have access to or you can, you can put into the AI systems or is that just government doesn't let you get at that camera data or how, do, how does that work? Uh, here Map and TomTom or other companies are spending a lot of money to develop high definition maps uh, which are not yet um, available on the market. Uh, and a big challenge is to create the first iteration of the map and then to keep it up to date like if lanes are changing, if you have a new traffic light to make sure this kind of information is inside the map. And what you are guessing is like a step further. It's like really real-time information coming from camera and et cetera. But we are really, really far away. Um, why not? I think it makes sense. It might help vehicles, but we are really far away from that. And this is why also vehicles need to have really powerful sensors in order to detect that by themselves. Because again, if you don't have connectivity, if you have some kind of latency, you don't want only to rely on external infrastructure. You have to have enough AI and enough sensors inside the vehicle to make sure you will be able to, uh, to handle this kind of situation. Down here in the front. Oh. Hi, I'm uh, Leslie. I'm the founder of Humanizing Autonomy. We build pedest pedestrian prediction models for self-driving cars and they have to be different <coughs> for different cities because of yes. cultural differences. Uh, so one challenge that we have is getting data. And I think that's a challenge for the whole of autonomous vehicles. And there are some uh, interesting examples of governments or academic institutions that are releasing data sets so that you can train your data. So it's one thing to have this real-time access to video footage of people crossing, but it's the other to actually train the models so that they can recognize mm -hmm. what those vehicles will then eventually see. So what I was wondering is, are there specific examples in China where there's an abundance of high volume, high quality data that is being released to private companies to develop models so that they can recognize, for example, where streets are or where people are moving? Um, I, I'm not aware uh, there are availability of large quantity of high definition data. I mean, that's why most of the autonomous driving companies are collecting their own mapping data in China. Although in China, I think uh, um, the government is encouraging uh, these efforts uh, by allowing these uh, mapping cars on the street uh, in certain cities. Uh, but in China also, the, 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 the licensing issue or the regulation requires that you have to have certain mapping sort of collection license. So that's why a lot of the startups also working with state-owned companies, or also large ma mapping companies. Uh, but I don't think that the government releases such data just to the mm. general public. Uh, the, the only thing I can comment on that uh, is that Baidu, with their Apollo project, uh, is probably the 
biggest supporter of an open source kind of platform if you partner with them. Uh, so because that's what they want to achieve, get like all the knowledge of all the different stakeholders which have anything to contribute to, to autonomous driving together. And I think, yeah, Baidu is really at the forefront and wants to release this. Uh, I, I like the idea of having, having an Android for autonomous driving. I, I think that's what they call it. So to follow the Google mo model um, uh, there. And uh, so I think probably that is the <laughs> best way of getting access to a, yeah, a, a huge bunch of maps and data uh, at the current point, and maybe over Baidu, finding other partners uh, in that community, uh, which is around that Apollo project. It's open source, but it's not free, because they want to manage data. <laughs> sure, in the end, it's not free. That is true. Maybe for trading reasons, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, my name is uh, Achol Kim. Yes, I'm from Korea, I suppose. Uh, I'm developed the RIDAR system. Uh, my question is, uh, normally is, uh, according to uh, uh, technical development, it gives uh, the many, many changes for human beings. Uh, like uh, iPhone, it gives many information uh, immediately, anytime, anywhere. But uh, I work uh, 24 hours, I can work 24 hours by iPhone. So we have, uh, normally is, uh, for the autonomous, autonomous uh, uh, we concept, I expect it gives many uh, benefit for human being. But I wonder is uh, is there any concern point for this technology development for human being or not? You have. Uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, just wonder. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Next question. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I, um, uh, I'm very interested in your question. That's uh, that's uh, uh, what we uh, give a lot of thoughts. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 this gentleman, your prior, prior question re regarding data, and probably the the, the, the key players or stakeholder on autonomous uh, vehicles are the, the 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 one who own data, not the one who has the capability to build cars or design cities. Is the who have the data probably the main stakeholder of these technologies. So uh, it's interesting to find out what interests these uh, uh, first wave or the pioneer of new technology. What interests them? Is that about car sale or, 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 or make sure the cars are running on the streets? But uh, uh, in terms of human beings, I think uh, what we like to promote and work very hard is to put people first. What's missing in our community and living environment? We put that first and use the technology to address that. Instead of putting the technology first and try to sell more cars. Sorry, Brian, I know you want to sell more cars. Yeah, but uh, there's always a way to have uh, the, the, the position uh, your, your, your purpose. And we believe, uh, yes, we talk about safety is one. The other is the comfort of mobility. And uh, again, I say ownership of mobility. You, you, you are not forced to take only one or two uh, 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 travel mode to, to, to get what you need. So uh, I think there's a lot to find out, a lot of to, uh, issue to address. Once we have that list, and we can see how uh, auto autonomous vehicles can address, I think that's the, the, the actual, at least approach uh, we can um, uh, start to initiate a collaboration. So make the idea and the purpose ahead of us and uh, develop our technology accordingly. One more back here, yeah. Um, yes, hi, um, actually the, my question is related to what the comment from Mr. Bangman uh, regarding Google versus Apple. Um, and what we're seeing now, and I'm actually confused about the direction that's going on uh, is, is that going to be an Apple scenario where they're making the hardware and the software? Or is it going to be a Google scenario where they're making l just a little bit of the hardware, <laughs> but they are opening up the entire OS and everything for else? Yeah. I mean, I come from the robotics world. Robotics world has actually greatly suffered because everybody's making the hardware and the software, and then they don't talk to each other and all that. And I don't know if you have any crystal balls to tell me what's the future of the autonomous vehicles. 
Um, yeah, yeah, if I may comment on that. So very, very interesting for us um, because we, um, with, with our sensors, we are building, we're also directly at that interface between building hardware and software components. Um, and we have to, um, on the one hand side, understand uh, the tier ones and the OEMs, uh, which are coming from we are building hardware. Um, and maybe building electronics, but they are the, the, their whole um, way of thinking is not uh, the, the way of a software company, not at all. Um, and, and that is something we are experiencing every month. Um, uh, we are working together with them. Um, so, and it is very difficult, even if they want to build software, they just, yeah, they just can't. They, they, they don't have this way of thinking, and building software is super different than building hardware. It is. Um, and on the other hand side, uh, the software companies um, um, uh, from with, with a very agile style of building software um, have huge difficulties in speaking the same language with, with, with OEMs. So, so in, in general, what, what we see, there is really no company, or, or not, may, should, there might be a few examples, which are really able to, to uh, of the big ones at least, of the incumbents, uh, which are able to build software and hardware at the same level and um, yeah, um, merge them in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, so therefore, um, I'm I'm very much um, in, in in favor of looking looking forward that there will be um, um, or the, the, the big software players will be working together with OEMs and and there will be a split pie um, of of the whole autonomous driving part. There will not be uh, the BMWs and uh, GMs or whatever which uh, will have the whole software and hardware part um, in, in inside of um, inside of their companies. Um, so, th so that's the what I just see and experience in the market um, um, every day. So, therefore, um, the, yeah, um, f fusing more players into this whole ecosystem uh, is the most probable um, way of, of, of going forward, I guess. The one, 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 one note maybe: uh, new companies which are entering the market, um, which, um, for example, companies like Cruise Automation, uh, um, um, with now GM in the background. Um, uh, they might have the expertise come having people from GM in the back to build cars and coming from the software and sensor side uh, because yeah it's like you know, a fresh startup with a lot of money and employing the best people in that space so there might be a few exceptions uh, but in general yeah I see it as a big ecosystem of hardware and software companies yeah yeah I would actually uh, just answer because we uh, shall promote is actually probably one of the very few that does hardware, software, and autonomous driving together in, in one package. What we found is that uh, it's very difficult to separate the two. If you only focus on hardware um, and all, you only focus on software, you cannot come up with a product that actually was the best user experience. Um, I mean, you mentioned Apollo, which I mean, they would like to use the, the software approach. They wanted this, okay, why don't you, OEM companies don't focus or spend money on software or Thomas driving, here you go, just use our platform. But Apollo, what happened was that because it, it, it has to be overlaying on all the different OEM platforms, it's very difficult for them to connect with the hardware, the tier one supplier parts to control the motors, the brakes, and function well. Uh, in order for the vehicle to respond, to provide the kind of experience that drivers are seeking, you have to really very deeply integrate the software and hardware piece together, and more so on top of autonomous driving you're developing yourself. So uh, I mean, our you know, belief is that the world has to really see the hardware and software very tightly integrate in order to develop uh, the type of um, uh, products that people can use on the road. A pure software approach, I think, will not get you there. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is we focused a lot on, I guess, AV-specific technology. In China, what are the sort of fundamental technologies for which the industries have to be further developed in order to support this? I'm thinking mostly of semiconductor chips, but are there other industries that need to be um, further developed in order to reach this goal? Well, I think, uh, you know, just look at what are the components on EV today we still need to source from outside of China or, or rely or dependent on, um, um, I think, global suppliers. I think chips, for example, you know, if you do autonomous driving, uh, there are only two or three choices you can really, you know, get. Um, so, so that's one area that uh, China still don't have a solution yet. Mm. Uh, I think um, uh, in, in a lot of ways, um, uh, battery technology um, in, I think, CATL, uh, domestic player, is gaining shear but they still don't have the cutting edge uh, battery technology. Mm -hmm. I think for China to get ahead in EV, 
I think uh, better technology is also important. Um, thirdly, I think uh, it is the, um, um, some of the tier one parts, uh, for example, uh, drivetrain. Um, Bosch has a lot of components that I think mm -hmm. almost everybody in China uses. Um, so I think uh, there's areas of technology or, or um, uh, parts I think uh, China still now rely on the uh, global suppliers. What I think China is doing uh, well on its own, one is I think they are probably more efficient uh, designing software system that manages power and manages uh, um, uh, the drivetrain. I think that's the area most of the China EV startup actually has their own capabilities and expertise. Uh, the other area I think China will potentially get ahead is how to really you know, design autonomous driving algorithm that fits Chinese driving scenario. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a big part of what I talked about is more localized uh, approach. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so I want to ask, uh, we can take maybe one more question, and then, um, and then I want to ask each of you for your sort of key takeaway. But how about one more question? Just in. Okay. Morning. My, I'm from Guangzhou. Uh, I have a, a very simple question. If, you know, uh, nothing is perfect. If there is a traffic accident, people dead, who will be responsible for this? Should, should us put the machine to the jail? I think it's impossible. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that was the question I posed is that um, legal well, today, obviously, you know, there's still I think driver's responsibility because there's no f autonomous driving commercially available yet. But in, in the world that when autonomous driving is going to be put on street, um, I, I, I think the challenge right now is there's no definition of legal liability uh, that's very clearly laid out for people to actually understand uh, who's at fault. Um, I think that's something is lacking. And that's one of the reasons I think we have not seen you know, commercial deployment of autonomous vehicles. Um, in order for, I think, uh, autonomous uh, driving to really be commercially viable, I, I think there needs to be a, a much more clear legal infrastructure uh, in place. Um, I don't think we have it today. Yeah, may, may, yeah maybe one, one answer to that. Um, so once you will have the regulation um, and uh, the cars have been tested, uh, under those conditions, normally the car shouldn't have any failures. Um, if there is a failure, then uh, that has to be adjusted in the future for, from the technology um, side to not make this scenario happen anymore. Uh, but then there are the insurances covering that. Uh, so it's just as simple as that. But you need to define the scenarios, have the legislation in place. Um, yeah, that's just the way it will work because you cannot cover every, every you cannot cover cover every scenario which will ever happen in in the future before you bring an autonomous driving vehicle to the road. And there will be scenarios which will not be covered, and there will be more deaths. That is, yeah, also not a question, sadly, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, okay. yeah. It's interesting that uh, I don't have an answer, but uh, it reminds me that uh, uh, AV uh, accident by AV, uh, we probably are still concerned about the liability rather than maybe the overall car accident ratio drop by having AV. So this is actually a different aspect, but eventually we still want who is responsible for even just one car accident. So uh, insurance is one way of doing that, but I believe insurance still need a, a base to evaluate. So I, uh, I'm not a technology owner, but uh, I believe, I hope, uh, the AI or future sensor system, whatever, actually much more advanced for, to help us to assess the ex what is ha exactly happening. So they should come along together with the advancement of this technology to help us to evaluate um, who is who's responsible. And uh, that's out of the legal uh, framework, but uh, I think eventually we come back to uh, protecting human beings. And we hope, we hope, I think, uh, you know, this technology actually help us to drop the ratio of a car accident. Just to wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you for your brief uh, takeaway from this, uh, this session, um, because I have some really good questions. So I'm just curious if you can just give your brief takeaway or bottom line. Coming away. We'll start in the end. 
Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I think br brief takeaway is very difficult because there have uh, there are so many <laughs> topics to discuss and think about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think in general, um, what, what, what we see is that uh, China has a leading role in autonomous driving and will have in the future. Um, I think uh, that um, yeah, Chinese roads and uh, Chinese traffic um, have yeah, have their own yeah, yeah, scenario which has to be solved. Um, and you will need loads and loads of players uh, which all cooperate um, as from the government over the car companies um, um, and, and so on to make yeah, to solve this as, as, as soon as possible to yeah, have a better way of living in the future. Two takeaways. Uh, one is I believe Chinese city has the uh, privilege and the opportunity uh, to, uh, to test and implement uh, autonomous vehicles uh, in a more a, uh, integrated way. So uh, what I learned from today is I think there's a, 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 a need to uh, identify a platform to uh, combine hardware software combine uh, car making, urban system planners, and also users. So all these people actually working on separate track with different interests and uh, to uh, succeed. I do believe China also given this opportunity to uh, find out uh, what kind of mechanism or even policy enable people to collaborate each other. I think that's, that's a big opportunity in China as well. And the other takeaway is I still believe that by hearing many gentlemen and uh, audience question, uh, I think eventually we look at the well wellness of people. So uh, these technologies could go very far or many directions, but I, I believe we have to try our best to go for that direction that make the people live better. Yeah, so um, you know, I think my takeaway is that I think uh, you know, it's clearly a vast opportunity for China, but I think there's still a number of uh, hurdles uh, for us to get to the full autonomous driving um, sort of stage, including technology, including legal, including consumer behavior and adoption. Um, that's one. Secondly, I think uh, um, I feel like uh, um, in order for autonomous driving to be um, and the end game, I think uh, not only it takes time, but it takes slow adoption and, and process to, for drivers or consumers to get you know, used to um, that world, uh, which means that it, it will you know, start with level two, level three, level four. I think there's gradual comfort driver will have to uh, face uh, an utilization of autonomous driving. Uh, and also having the vehicles slowly having increasing capability on the road for people to drive and to test and to get comfortable with is also very, very necessary. So that, I think that process uh, will involve, um, you know, I think uh, um, a long time, but also I think involve technology to be slowly upgrading and slowly uh, adopting um, to, to the full autonomous driving scenario. I agree with what was said about China, and I think China is in a really good position to have specific technologies adapted to, to China use cases. Uh, but maybe my takeaway is really about the transition period. It's going to take a long time where we are going to have autonomous vehicles working together with human-driven vehicles. We will have several types of autonomous vehicles with or without maps, uh, with or without teleoperation. And it's all about building an ecosystem. You need good connectivity, you need good map, uh, for sure, you need good regulation and, and rules about liability and who is going to do what. And also cities at some point maybe have to be adapted or we have to modify a few things in our cities or we have to decide that only one part of a city is uh, like reserved for autonomous vehicles. So it's all a step-by-step -step approach. We are going to see that quite fast in closed sites, campuses, industrial sites, sooner in some city centers with first robotaxi types of deployment, mm -hmm. but like deployment everywhere at any time, at any condition, uh, in all cities around the globe, it's going to take a really long time. I'm gonna give the last word to Michelle, but I wanna thank you all so much, and um, Michelle, are we, for your key takeaway. Well, uh, thank you all very much, and thank you for all the questions. Sounds like communication is key, not just with the people, so they can understand and be prepared for it, but to communicate with what kind of life we want to live, what is that quality. Communication with the technology from a systems 
perspective and as well as the infrastructure to allow for that communication. And we look forward to helping forge these communications and to be a platform to allow this to happen. So thank you all very much. A big round of applause, please, thank for you. everyone here. Thank you.